last time when we were working through Ephesians, uh, we, we walked through Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, um, Pastor Terrence taught. And, and we, we learned there that, you know, at first we were, we were by nature fallen creatures, sinful creatures, right? dead in our trespasses, sons of disobedience, children of God's wrath. These were the phrases Paul used to describe our previous states. We were without hope. Nothing we can do to save ourselves. But in verse 4, verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, in fact, if you guys have your Bibles, go and turn to Ephesians chapter 2 right now, because uh, we're, we're going to be going and covering through that. We're going to be covering specifically verses 8 to 10, but I'm going to recap a little bit, because everything in that passage flows as a logic. And so in verse 4, we catch a turning point in this story. A turning point where where God intervenes and enters our life, right? It's a turning point of your life when God enters, when God intervenes. He flips the world upside down. He does what is unexpected. He works in miracles. And the greatest miracle that God can do is make what is dead alive, right? No one else in the world can do such a thing. Only God can. And He made you alive. He did that through His Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and after three days, God raised Christ up from the grave and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. right? That He raised Him up and seated Him at His right hand. But not only that, but he, God did the same thing for us as his saints. The exact same thing. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, he says that he raises up with him, with Christ, and see us with Christ in the heavenly places. So when Christ gets honored and placed in the seat of glory, we too get, get raised up with him and get seated with him. And, and all that's amazing. And we will, we, will, we will witness that and we will experience that and it will be a glorious time. But that is in the future. And so the question that we want to hit upon now tonight is that while our future fruition awaits us, meaning our future reward awaits us, what does it mean to have salvation now here on earth? That's... That's what we're going to look at in our passage today. In verse 5, Paul writes in parentheses, in the middle, at the end of verse 5, in some Bibles it's parentheses, and in mine he uses um, dashes. It says, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. And, And this here, this little comment, may seem like a random note that Paul scribbled in, like a random thought that just popped into his head. But, in actuality, this is, this is probably the topic, the, the, the central topic, the title of this one section. And while he made this quick comment here, he's going to flush it out more so from verses 8 to 10. What does this mean? Be saved by grace. Be saved by grace. What, are, what is the impact of that? And what does that have to do with us now? And so, you have your Bibles, go ahead. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to go ahead and read. I'll read from verse 8 to 10. I'll give us the lay of the land here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. This is God's word. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So, so for this message, we're going to go ahead and look through these three verses. Each verse is pretty much its own point. But I want you guys to view these points not as if they're like points at, on equal levels. These are actually more like points as if they're a flow of thoughts. Right? So this is going to be going from one thought to another. We're going to go on a journey here. And the first thing we're going to see in verse 8 is the road to salvation. Paul here repeats that key phrase that we looked at in verse 5. By grace you have been saved. 
by grace you have been saved. Then Paul adds at the end of that, by grace you have been saved through faith. And faith here is the key. Faith here is the key to salvation, the road to salvation. Here, faith is everything. Without faith, no one can be saved. In Romans 3, 30, it says that God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Faith is the only way to salvation. What is faith? One commentator put it this way. He says that faith is trust and confidence in people or God. Faith is trust and confidence in people or God. Faith, faith is trust. It, it runs deep. It, like, think about it for a moment. If I, if I heard to approach you while you're studying for your finals week, you're, you're going nuts, and you're, you're stressed now, and I, I approach you and I say, you know what, don't worry. I, I have complete faith in you that you would do well. What does that mean when I say something like that? It, it means that I have full confidence in you and your ability. Like, that you can actually do this. That you will not fail. But where does that faith come from? How can someone say that I have faith in you? How can you say you have faith in something? Right? How can you say that you have faith in yourself? How can you say you have faith in your friends? How can you say you have faith in your car? Or, or, or what? Anything. How, how can you say something like that? Faith stems from knowledge. There's a, there's a, there's, you have to know the object of which you're putting your faith into. You, you know the object, and you know its power and its ability. In other words, if I say I have faith in you, it means that I know you. And I know your abilities. I know your ranking. I know your rating. I know you're at 99 score level, right? And therefore, I have no reason to doubt your success at this time. And so when it says here that we, that you have been saved by grace through faith, that faith right there means that we know God. And we know who God is. And we know His characteristics and His powers and His ability. Right? Faith doesn't come blindly. Faith is something that we see clearly in God. We fully trust in God because we read His Word and we believe it to be true. Right? We read in His Word that He created the world and everything is underneath His sovereign control. We read in His Word that God delivered Israel, pulled them through the Red Sea, split the Red Sea up, and brought them through. And we believe that to be true. Right? When, we, when we started through Esther earlier this year, we believed that God was the one in sovereign control. That he placed Esther and Mordecai in their positions to save their people. We believe that to be true. And we see God do this time and time again, always intervening to save his people. And so when we come then to the cross, and we see that God, and we read and we and we read that God placed his son, sent his son to the cross to take on flesh, to die a death that we deserve. We believe that to be true. And we believe that He raised Christ up on the third day in victory over sin. And we believe in all that. And it's in that faith that we have in God that we are saved by His grace. And it is, and it is only by His grace that God was willing to sacrifice His Son for us. Because we don't deserve such a gift. This is, this is, guys, this is why it's so important to read God's Word. Right? This is why it's so important that we emphasize over and over again, read your scriptures. Be in it constantly, day by day. Because when you, when you come to scripture, you're reading about, you're communing with God, you're coming to know Him and His character and His power. You come to know who God is. We don't read the Word of God just to make us feel better. We come to the Word of God to cement our faith in Him. When we come to read Scripture, we come to know that God indeed is reliable and trustworthy. We come to read Scripture so we can put our faith in Him. 
Because God himself is faithful. And he never once broke his promise. Salvation is, by, is based on our faith in God's grace. And that means salvation. In salvation, we cannot give one ounce of credit to ourselves, to our own work. Which is why in Paul, he continues in verse 8. He says, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Here, this word, this, refers to this entire phrase of being, by grace you have been saved through faith. This, this whole concept is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And here, the center again is God. The focus is God. The emphasis is God. That this gift of salvation is centered fully upon God and not us. That we did nothing to earn our salvation. God worked and paid for it all by giving up His Son for us. I mean, we, we weren't even, we we're not worthy to receive such a gift. We're not worthy to be recipients of such a love. And so we can take no credit, we can take no pride, we can take nothing from salvation. We can only receive it. Salvation is from God, and therefore all credit, all honor, all gratitude goes to God alone. And we heard this over and over again. Right? Paul preached this all over the place. Every city he went to, Paul preached this central truth. And you know, as I was saying that, I'm sure many of you guys have heard this all throughout your church life. This is nothing new. But why then do we must we continue to teach upon this? What does this have to do for us now? Why does Paul even write this in here? If the Ephesian church knew this. I mean, he, he, he taught there for so many years. They knew this truth. Why emphasize it again? Why does Paul continue to point back to the central truth? The Ephesian church back then was, well, Ephesus was, was this big international city. Right? It, and a lot of people come in and out of it. So there are a lot of different influences, a lot of different religions going through. And so, because of that, there's a lot of discussion about what is true religion, what is not. What is, what is, how, how, who is really God? It's, it's much like the conversations we have now in the U.S., being such an international country. We have all these different groups, Muslims, Jewish people, Catholics, Buddhists, Hindu, all these religions, world religions, coming into this one melting pot. Even within Christianity, there's all these cults that broke off, and we don't, how do we know they're cults? How do we know they're not true? You know, movements like the Mormons, Jehovah's Witness. With all these different discussions of religion out there, how do we know which one is true, which one's not? And that's why Paul comes back to this central truth about Christianity. Because being saved by grace, by faith alone, is what makes Christianity distinct from all other religions. This teaching, we have to know it. Because this is what makes Christianity true. If you think about all these other religions out there, and you strip away all the nuances of these religions, you strip them down to their very core, you'll find that all these religions are based on human work. And they're based on our efforts to please a God or to just please ourselves. There's human effort to make us feel better, to reach a better place. Only Christianity teaches us that none of our works does anything. Only God can do something. <clears throat> that is what makes Jesus Christ the only way the only truth, and the only life. You guys, you know, as fallen human beings, this goes against our nature. Right, we, we long for control in our lives. When we, we, we like to be able to do stuff with our hands. Right, many of you guys are, are engineers, and I'm sure that 
you know, instead of learning from someone else, you'd rather just be grabbing equipment and just doing it yourself. Right. And, and I think when we, when we get that, when, we, when we're able to hold things in our hands and, and do these on our own, we feel capable. We feel powerful. We feel like we're in control. That is, that, that's what we yearn for, right? It gives us confidence when we're able to do something. Right? For those people who are competitive, we would never like to enter into a game that we have no skill in because we can't compete in it. We have zero confidence in, in playing that game. But we have any kind of skill, then those who are competitive will just go gun hold thinking we're the best in the world. Right? The minute you have some kind of ability, there's confidence with that. And it's confidence that we can have in ourselves. But here in Ephesians, we learn that our salvation comes not from us, but from God Himself. You see, when we do things ourselves, we can see with our own eyes, tangibly. We can feel with our own hands. We can work with it. But when it comes to our salvation, it is being worked by an invisible God, doing invisible work by His hands. That is something that is totally outside of our control. You know what that does? It makes us feel weak. It makes us feel weak about our own ability because we know we cannot earn our own salvation. It's impossible. And that's what it means to place our faith in God. Faith is a direct contrast to work. Because faith lets go. Right? Imagine this way. Imagine you're hanging onto a cliff. You're hanging onto a cliff and, you're, and, and you have like a thousand feet straight drop below you. And you're hanging onto your life and you're working so hard. Right? Your muscles are giving out. Your grip is loosening. And you're hanging on. But while you're hanging on, God is also somehow holding onto you. Maybe by your shirt. Maybe by, by your hand. And he's trying to pull you up. But he can't because you have to let go in order to get pulled up. And many times, we don't want to let go. Because when we keep holding on, it makes us feel secure. But God is saying, let go. Because I have hold of you. And that's, that's us trusting God completely in His strength, in His power, and his ability to save. And that's faith. That's, that's the basis of what we, of what we need and, and how we walk. Right? When it says we walk by faith and not by sight, that's exactly what that passage means. Faith defines a Christian. It defines our religion. defines what we believe in. And our faith is in God alone. Not that of ourselves, but in God who by His, by His grace gives us salvation, paid by His own blood. Which leads us then to our next point, which is our response then to this grace. What is our response to such a grace? What is our response to such a gift? In verse 9 it says, Not a result of works, so reemphasizing that this is not from our own work, why? So that no one may boast. No one may boast. Our greatest, our, our response to such a gift is humility. There is nothing that we can boast about. Humility should penetrate everything that we are, everything that we do. And we have our faith in God. The humility should saturate our speech, our actions, our behavior. There should be no pride no exaltations of ourselves. We have done nothing to earn this salvation. Think about that for a moment. Because, again, I, we, you guys heard this before, that we, as Christians we need to be humble, that we shouldn't have pride. But yet in our hearts, we tend to struggle with this constantly, don't we? Don't you? Like, for instance, when you fall into sin, what is your immediate response? When you feel guilty, 
or something you've done, what is your immediate response to that? Do you open your Bible and read, thinking that it would remove your guilt? Do you pray for, I don't know, 15 minutes on your knees, thinking that it would atone your wrong? Do you look to do something good as if you need to balance out the wrong that you just did? What do you do? What is your response? You see, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing those things, but many times, you see, our harsh response to sin, that response tends to be work-based, not faith-based. And this is what sin does to us. Sin raises our doubt in Christ and puts our trust back in ourselves, back in our own works. Instead, we need to see sin for what sin really is. Sin is us, wretched, filthy, dirty, useless, hopeless. And that should make us cry out back to God and reaffirm our faith in Christ who can do something about it. And is in that light then, should we go to prayer, to scripture, to repentance, and to good works? If our faith is in God, it says here that we have nothing to boast. And, and, and really what it's saying is that we have nothing to boast in ourselves. Nothing to boast in ourselves. Because scripture is clear in other spots that we should indeed boast. But we should boast of God. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul drives this truth home, right? He, he emphasizes that we are not saved because we are noble, because we're strong, because we're wise. He, he says that we're none of that. And yet we're saved. And therefore, the result of that, the response to that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, it says, let, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is like the son being proud of his father, right? If, 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 his, if a son sees his father do a heroic deed, the son didn't do anything. The father did everything. And yet the son beams proudly because of his, because of his hero. In the same manner, we boast of our father of Christ. The great price that he paid to purchase our souls and to adopt us. And this impacts everything. This impacts everything that we do in life. Everything that we do in life it must have some kind of feel of humility in it. Right? Every time we work, every time we, we, we obey God, we, we must come at it with a humble attitude. <laughs> Think, for instance, why we get burnt out. Why do you get burnt out? A lot of you guys serve in different areas. Why does it get hard? for us? Why does it get hard for you? Many times Christians tend to burn out not just because they're taking on too much but because they believe they need to take on that much. Right? They, perhaps they are, so there's weight of expectations from the church that if you need to serve this way in order to prove that you're faithful. Maybe you're serving because you need to, you need to justify your place in this church. That if you're not serving, then you'll feel unchristian, like you don't belong. Perhaps you serve because it's your way to feel useful, to justify your work to God, that God was right to save you. I mean, think about our own Asian culture. A lot of times when we receive a gift, a simple thank you isn't enough. Our, our Asian culture tells us that we need to reciprocate somehow. Next time we see them, we need to bring a gift, right? It's the same value. Or else it's, it doesn't match. Right? Think about how that impacts the way we view our salvation. Do you guys tend to view salvation the same way? Our salvation is purchased by the blood of Christ. It is secured by the blood of Christ. There is no debt you have to pay, guys. Our only response to such a gift is humility. And that humility comes out in our gratefulness. That humility comes out in our attitudes. That humility comes out in our worship. 
We give glory to God who gives us this. There is no other proper response. Which then leads us then to the third step in Paul's logic here. If we did nothing to earn our salvation, what then does that mean for us today as Christians? How do do we live as Christians? Here we see the result of our salvation. The result of our salvation, verse 10, Paul here answers the question I posed in the beginning. If heaven is our final destination, what does our life right now look like on earth? Verse 10 says this, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Salvation is not just a promise that will be fulfilled in the future. Salvation is a reality. A reality that can be experienced now. Paul says here that we are today, we are today His workmanship. Here, workmanship is used only twice in the New Testament, the Greek word for workmanship. And the other time it's used, is used to describe creation. And that, that other time it's used, is used in Romans 1.20. And so, it says that, that if we are His workmanship, mean we are His creation. That God, in, in saving us, has brought something out of nothing had brought what was dead to life and molded an object of worth out of something that was nothing, that was valueless. There is something amazing about all this, right? Earlier earlier this week, I was listening to a podcast and, and they were talking, the, this guy on the podcast, he's, it's, a non, it's a sticker podcast, um, and so the guy was sharing about how his friend when he was younger, his friend committed suicide. And 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 going through all his stuff, he saved actually the last bits of pieces of his friend's like Facebook posts and emails and saved them to a folder. And here and there again for the next year or so, he he will revisit that folder. And he'll look through it and read through his friend's posts. And he this is the way he described it is this. He said that in the midst of reading that, I felt like I was doing something right. Because when I was reading my friend's last posts, last emails, I felt a sense of sadness in the midst of the dull feelings I had over his death. Right? And, so, and so there's a sense of like, when he was, during his friend's um, suicide, he, there's, his emotions kind of went dull, numb. But in the midst of reading his emails again, he felt alive again because there's these emotions that come out. And, and, I, and, and while so many things in the world can do that, we're always looking to, to feel that way again, to feel alive in our emotions again. And, and the world looks to different things that can help themselves do that, right? But the way Christianity is different, is Christianity is not therapy. Christianity isn't a feel-good mantra. In Christianity, it says here, God recreated us, brought us from dead to life. He took away what was broken and placed in us a new heart that beats after His own will with purpose, with emotion, as alive. One more time, to feel true joy, true sorrows. That, that is amazing. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And we see later in Ephesians chapter 4, 24, that Paul says to put on a new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We are created in the new. The old has died, and the new has risen. In other words, we put away the sins of our past and strive forward in righteousness. This is not just a status change. This is not just therapy. This is real. 
that our entire heart, our entire character, our entire self was, has been changed through salvation, during salvation. So we are His workmanship. With emphasis on His, God is the one doing this. God is the one working in us and on us. God is the one who started it. God is the one who will complete it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We are that good work. And that work is not complete now. God has created us anew, but the finished product is still yet to be seen. All we know is that the finished product is that we have a master template we need to follow. And that master template, that prototype, is Christ. That's why it says here we are being created in Christ Jesus. He is the image of God. And day by day we are being formed to look more and more like Him. And then it says that we are created in Christ for good works. For good works, which God has prepared beforehand. Meaning God's plan since the beginning was this. That He didn't save you just for the sake of saving you, but He saved you with a purpose. Right? This is, this is pretty much, Paul already stated this back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Right? When, when he says that He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. God works in such mysterious ways, but His plans always play out. Which is why we put our faith in Him. As we place our faith in God, we can see God do great things in our lives. And what He's doing in us is He's preparing us. Preparing us for good works. Great works. Wonderful works in His name. This, this right here, what we're seeing here, is the result of our new life in Christ. That our workmanship, our, his, our workmanship, our creation, His creation in us, leads to good works. That means we no longer walk in sin, but we walk in righteousness. Right? That's why it says at the end that we should walk in them. Notice the word walk. It means that we are doing this by second nature. That this is our habits. That we're not forcing this. We're not, it's not saying we, we do good works. It says we're going to walk in them because God is the one who prepared it. God is the one who made it, who created it, who prepared the good works ahead of us, saved us for the purpose of His good work, that we may walk in it, through it, with them. In other words, good works becomes a part of our daily routine. And when it says here, good... What Paul means by good, he means morally good for you personally and beneficially good for the people around you. What we get here is that you are not saved by good works, but you are indeed saved for good works. And guys, this, this is not optional. If you are saved, you will demonstrate a change in your life. This change towards good works should prove your salvation. This is not the reason for your salvation, but it should prove it. It is the effect, not the cause. That is why James emphasized works in, in his letter. In James chapter 2, verse 26, he says, Faith apart from works is dead. And so we follow Paul's logic here in Ephesians. We find here that first our salvation rests upon God and His grace, which then leads to us receiving the salvation through faith, through our trust in Him. And by that, we are created anew, raised from the dead to new life, a life crafted after Christ Himself, so that we can then do good works and be light in this world. What that means for us now, guys, it means that we have great purpose in this world. We have great purpose in life. We have great purpose of good works. What is that good work? Well, I mean, if, practically speaking in, this, in Ephesians, that good works is everything from chapters 4 to 6. But 
we will be preaching those passages in weeks to come. So, but for now, you guys can read those on your own. I won't go into the details of it. But we want to recognize that these good works exist in us now, today, that we should be able to live in them. And yet, at the same time, if you guys have ever read Ephesians chapter 4 to 6, we find that those living that way, living such a holy, blameless life, it's really difficult, right? It's really hard. To just stay pure, to to set aside our selfishness, to set aside our laziness, to put away our desires, our wants, so that we can obey God, it's hard. It's hard to stop sinning and start doing good. Because like, you know, it, it, even the fact that if you're able to do good, sometimes when we do it, we're like questioning ourselves, is this legalism? Or am I doing this by faith? And your thoughts, what, what, you, what, what we're asking when we're struggling through these, is we're saying, how do I present myself as God's workmanship to this world? How do we do that? Well, in order to, in order to see how all this plays out, why it's so important that Christ is the center of all this, why it's so important that we walk by faith and that we're able to do these good works in faith, the way that works, you can find that answer in John chapter 15. So turn with me there. John chapter 15, we encounter the famous passage where Jesus speaks to his disciples and he tells them to abide in him. Right, where Jesus compares himself to a vine and compares us to branches. That without Jesus, we cannot produce any fruit. But let's read through then John 15, chapters, um, verses 1 through 6. John 15, verses 1 through 6. This is what Jesus says. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Just note that right there in verse 3. Already you are clean. Already you are clean because of the word. Meaning, he here spoke speaking to people who are already saved. People who already received the gift of salvation. And from that, then a bag in Christ. You don't get saved because you're abiding in Christ. You're saved first. And then you abide in Christ to continue growing to bear fruits. Verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered and thrown into fire and burned. We see here how, how we need to abide in Christ in order to grow. That without the vine, without Christ, we can do nothing. Nothing at all. And those who can't do anything... Pretty much what Jesus says here is that he is thrown away, they're gathered, they're thrown to fire and burn. In other words, useless branches are thrown to hell. But we are saved. In other words, when we are saved, we are already, we're connected to Christ. We are in Christ already. The vine should be our source of good works. What does that mean? It means that in every way, we become enabled to do good work by fellowshipping with Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is, is how we do good works. That we need to know Him and have a personal relationship with Him. And we do that by being saved by Him. And as we're saved by Him, Jesus says, remain in Him, abide in Him, continue that relationship, deepen that relationship. And we do that by reading God's Word because Jesus is the Word. John 1 1. Right? We pray because Jesus is the great high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. 
when we spend time with our fellow brothers and sisters at church, because the church is Jesus' body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. This is how we abide in Christ. By doing all this, it says here in John 15, that we will bear much fruit. Those who do not abide in Christ, or those, in other words, those who are not saved, they will bear no fruit, they'll be thrown away, but we will be found useful. Now let us keep reading John 15. John 15, verse 7. John 15, verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. That's right here, that's a that's a great statement. I mean, let's, 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 let's think about this for a moment. That if you abide in Christ, He says you can ask whatever you wish. Does that mean we should ask for a million dollars? Well, you can. Don't know what I'll do for you. But that's not the point of this passage. The point of this passage here is that as we abide in Christ, our hearts will be transformed to be more and more aligned with His will. As we continue abiding in Christ, we will be more and more like Him. And so that our prayers and what we ask for, we will be asking, we'll be asking for in His name. Because our desires will be more and more aligned with His desires. And thus, then, whatever we ask will be granted to us. And then we will be enabled to bear fruit and do good works. That is why, then, in verse 8, Jesus says, By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. You are God's workmanship. Meaning God is working in you and transforming your heart. And all we're asked to do is to be faithful. And we are to abide and place our faith in Christ. And as we continue to seek Christ out in all things, as we continue to abide in Him, we will find that God will use us in such mighty ways. That's what it means for us to walk then in His workmanship and not in ours. Not in our work, but in His work. Get this, guys. Because you are saved, your life has more purpose now, matters more now than before you were saved. Because now you are useful. That's the great blessing God has given us in salvation. That we have received purpose in life so that we can continue in good works. Many of you guys have just finished finals. Let me ask you, what are you going to be doing this summer? What purpose what you live for. Let me encourage you then to abide in Christ and challenge your ways to grow then in good works, knowing that you have a purpose in life now. For those of you guys who graduated or are graduating, let me encourage you that the God who saves you also has a purpose for you. That as you guys enter whatever's next, whether it be the working world or graduate school, I'll just say the working world because that's where I went right afterwards. Like, it's a scary world. It's unknown. Right? <clears throat> I, I remember when, when even though I, I worked, at, worked at a software company for years and I was sent off to do different client sites, every new client site I went to, I still felt this anxiety. I still feel lost in the midst of that work. Right? It's just like, I have to do all this over again. Why am I doing this? Is it worth it? To, to really travel and, and sacrifice so much time and energy to do all this. But let's not let that distra distract us from our true purpose in Christ. In other words, continue to remember your true purpose. Abide in Christ. Read His Word. Attend church regularly. Pray and fellowship with one another. Grow. And as you continue to grow in Christ, you will find yourself approaching the working world or if you're in school, approaching school approaching the summer in humility in humility it will change 
your attitude. You'll be ready to submit to God's will. You will work hard. You will be responsible. You will help others around you. You'll build relationships. Because that is the fruit of abiding in Christ. And as the outside world meets you, man, they will know that something is different about you. Yesterday in IT, I remember Calvin was sharing with us how one of his co-workers approached him and they were in a long car ride together to the site and, and he was just sharing how he, you know, how, how he's a Christian to his co-worker. And his co-worker is just pointing Calvin out and three other people in their company out saying how, yeah, you guys are different. Like, you guys are actually nice and care for people. And those three other people along with Calvin, they were all faithful Christians living there. It shines through, guys. When we abide in Him, and then we're, and we walk with Christ. And when the outside world meets you, they, when they see that something is different, when they see that you see in a different tune, that will create an opportunity for you to glorify God by sharing about Christ to them. The big idea tonight is that we boast in God's work of salvation by humbly walking in imitation of Christ. When we do good in this world, we boast of God and His salvation. That God is glorified and not us. That we do not do good for our own pride, for our own self-interest. We do good with a humble spirit, seeking always to honor God who saved us. We have this new life in Christ. So then may Jesus Christ be your Lord and Savior. May one day, may, may you just continue to just walk with Christ. And, and keep your eyes focused then upon the reward that you'll receive at the end. That one day we will indeed be seated with Christ in heaven. And that day will be awesome because there will be no more finals forever. <laughs> Until that day comes, strive forward to represent Christ. Walk with Him. Abide in Him. And let's then worship Him in that way as well. I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer and invite Angie up to close with one song. Pray with me. Father, I thank You for, for Your Word. Your good Word that teaches us that we are saved by grace through faith. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful truth that is. Oh, Lord, may that truth then be the keystone of our life. May, may it be what we rest our salvation upon, our life upon, to know that in you, Lord, we are created new to do great things in your name. We are your workmanship. And so, Lord God, our Master, our King, may we submit our lives to you, to trust in you, to walk with you, to abide in you, so that we may accomplish your great purpose in us. I pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.